Well, good morning. Great to see you this morning. Glad that you were here. As I was driving in this morning, I was looking at the landscaping and everything around the church, and uh, we have a group of people who do a fantastic job of helping to make sure the outside of the church looks well. And uh, so if you have to see any of those people, uh, let them know. And uh, it's, it's a great job to be able to drive in and see everything being taken care of at the church. Glad that you are here this morning. Beautiful day outside, some great weather again, and uh, but we're glad that you're here with us for service this morning. If you'd like to stand, I want to ask you to look around, find somebody that you haven't waved hi to yet this morning or whatever, and just wave and welcome them to sunlight. Welcome this morning.
In Psalm 147, we find these words. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is the Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. We praise God for his word and for this reminder. And this is the great and awesome God for whom we direct all of our worship, all of our honor this morning. And as we continue to worship him, and as we come into this time of prayer, I want to share a couple requests with you from our church family. Uh, we ask that you be in prayer for uh, the Carol Curry family. Uh, this is Brendan Nunley's aunt uh, who passed away this past week. Keep the Curry family and the Nunley family in your prayers in these days for God's comfort and peace to be upon them during this time. I uh, would ask that you be in prayer for uh, Janet Rogers' uh, great-granddaughter, Kinsley. Uh, Kinsley's just nine months old, uh, but she's been dealing with, a, with an illness. And just keep Kinsley in your prayers for God's healing touch to be upon her. I uh, would ask that you be in prayer for Pastor Lyle's brother-in-law, uh, Noel, uh, as uh, he was recently diagnosed with COVID. So keep Noel in your prayers, as well as Pastor Lyle's sister Phyllis and the family uh, during this time for God's protection uh, and healing to be upon him and to be upon the family. Many more requests that we can mention. And the altars are open. So as we continue to worship the Lord together, uh, maybe you want to spend some time at the altars, or maybe you want to spend some time just right where you're at, in a posture of prayer, however you so choose, we encourage you, we invite you as the worship team leads us.
God, we are so grateful, God, for the privilege of being together this morning. God, for those that are with us here physically, for those that are joining us online, for those that are joining us later this week, God, we pray right now, God, that you would meet with us, God, right where we're at in our time of need. God, you know the requests that have been mentioned. You know the requests that are on our hearts. God, whether it's the need for healing, whether it's the need for, for peace and comfort. God, over a family that's grieving. God, whether it's, God, that your provision in a, in a time and in a season of great uncertainty. God, whatever the case might be. God, we, we cry out to you because we know, God, that you hear us and we know that you strengthen us. So, God, we entrust all of these things to you. God, we entrust, uh, God, uh, our nation before you. God, in this time of uncertainty and, and unrest and, uh, and pandemic, God, we just, we pray that you would have your way. God, that your people, God, uh, would, would rise up and be the church that you've called us to be. And God, that here, God, in this body of believers, God, uh, that, that you've called us together, God, for a purpose, God. So, God, we pray that you would empower us even this week. God, as we go out, God, amongst our, our schools and our workplaces and our families and our neighborhoods, God, strengthen us for the task at hand. Remind us, God, that the, uh, God, the harvest fields are ripe and that there's those, God, that we encounter each and every day that need to know you. So, God, we pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see the needs all around us and give us the strength to meet them in ways that uh, we only can with you. God, finally, we just pray your continued encouragement and blessing over the service this morning. May our, may our time together continue to be pleasing to you, and may you have your way. We pray all these things this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. up a bulletin on your way in this morning. I uh, just want to remind you, as always, uh, during this coming worship song, um, as we uh, prepare to worship the Lord in our giving, you're welcome to, if you haven't already, uh, taking advantage of uh, taking your tithes and offerings to the boxes at, at each door in the back. You can also um, mark your attendance with us this morning by tearing out the back flap in the bulletin, depositing that back there as well. And finally, just because we want there to be one more thing for you to do this morning, there is a neat yellow card in, in your bulletins this morning that uh, is, a, is a very brief questionnaire. We are looking at rolling out some additional uh, discipleship and, and small group and Bible study options this fall. And I uh, want to get your input on that. So um, if you could take a moment, um, preferably during Pastor Lyle's message this morning, you know, um, because the beauty of that is, you can, you, can be, you can be sitting there, and you can be looking up, and you can be nodding your head, and you can be, you know, writing things down, but you're actually filling this out. But Pastor Lau's going to be just going, man, everybody has taken notes this morning. This is incredible. So, uh, anyway, feel free to do that uh, at any point uh, between now and the close of the service, or at the close of the service, you're welcome to do that as well. We're actually going to have a $25 uh, Hughes gift card drawing um, for, uh, for all the folks that fill these out. So... Um, so that's that's pretty cool. So go ahead and you know take your time to, to do that, and you can put those in the uh, in the baskets and the boxes in the back uh, by the doors when you leave here this morning. Also, so I encourage you to do that. Thank you in advance for completing those. We just want to continue to offer options and resources for folks as we head into uh, this uh, this next season of, of ministry here. So um, the worship team is going to lead us once again here in just a moment. But I just want to pray now over the tithes and offerings that uh, are going to be collected this morning. So if you'd pray with me once again. Father God, we, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of being able to uh, gather together this morning. We thank you for the, 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 the faithfulness of, of your people. And God, we thank you for, uh, God, just the generosity, God, uh, of those here. And God, we thank you for uh, just the opportunity, God, to, to give back. Uh, God, in a small way. So, God, with the, with the tithes and offerings, God, we just uh, we pray that you would bless the gift, you bless the giver. And, God, continue to empower us as a church, God, uh, to offer ministries, to offer resources, to offer encouragement. God, to be the light in this community that you've called us to be. So we pray all these things this morning. In Christ's name.
be seated. Gear shift, I could do it. <laughs> I am uh, here to remind you about a great event that is taking place tonight. And it's going to be here at the church, 6 o'clock. That was the one, isn't it? Okay. I, that was the only thing I didn't check on to make sure, but I was pretty sure. 6 o'clock. And uh, I, I want to read something to you. And it says here in chapter 19 of Luke, And as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in the heavens and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees and the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will, will throw up the bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in one stone left upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You know, these scriptures are a great reminder of how important it is for God's people to come together and to keep stones silent. Now, I am so thankful that as we have been worshiping here this morning and praising God, the, the whole parking lot has been real quiet because the stones don't have to cry out because we're in here praising God. And that's part of what this evening is going to be about. It's about coming together and worshiping God. It's, it's about praising God. It's about praying God. Because, beloved, if there's ever been a time when our nation has needed the church to rise up and to pray, it's definitely today. Because when it says here that all this was going to happen to Jerusalem because he said you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Sometimes it's so easy to take for granted that God is right here. And tonight we need to also hear some testimonies about how God has changed lives. You know, I, I just, I am so thankful that God has changed me. You know, he took me from what I was to what I am today, and he'll take me from today to what I will be later on, and I just can't wait. I mean, I, God has been so good. We sang that song, Amazing God, and I looked at Yvonne and I said, oh my goodness, this is what we've just been talking about. We, she sent me a thing about frogs croaking, and it was from our backyard. The birds sing, and, and I'm just reminded, Creator God, all the things that make their own unique noises. And we of all people should be coming together and saying, wow, that's my God. And tonight we're going to do that. And, and the, you know, and what even makes it even better, I mean, not only do we get to pray and to, and to really make a difference, we're going to be praying for our community, for our school system, for, we, we need to pray for those in authority, especially for our police officers right now. Around this nation, our church can make a difference in California. Please, please be a part of that. Tonight is going to be an extremely important time for us to get together to pray for our community and all. But in, even with all that, 
the testimonies, the prayer time, the difference we'll make in that prayer time, the praising of God, it ends with ice cream. I mean, what more do you want? I mean, my goodness. And so uh, that's, that's one of my weaknesses. And um, I don't know why. I, well, yeah, I do, because it's so good. But my whole purpose on getting up here is just to remind you about this evening. Please come and be a part of this. Uh, be a part of, you know, coming with a, a testimony, even prepared, to say what God has done for you. To be a part of that. Be ready to, to sing and, and, to, and to worship, to, to just do everything that God would want you to do. It's going to be a great time. So, please. I said please, and that's, I, that should be all you have to say, right? But thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. And I echo Carl's statements. Please be here tonight at 6 o'clock. At this time, our kids can be released to go to uh, the powerhouse. You can go right out the, the door there. And your teachers are waiting for you to have uh, children's church this morning. So have a great time this morning. Well, good morning. Are you glad to be in God's house? If you are, say amen. 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 You know, sometimes we forget. Uh, that's hard to believe. But sometimes we forget what an awesome privilege we have in coming together and worshiping and celebrating our Lord. And what we are doing here this morning is not allowed everywhere. And according to Scripture, it may not even be allowed here in this country someday. But we have the opportunity if to come and worship him and we're free to do that and sometimes we forget that and sometimes we we think well you know i got other things to do but this is probably one of the most important things you can do any time of the week and that's to be together as brothers and sisters and praising god and worshiping him and uh so if you are here live with us this morning we want to welcome you or if you're watching us on the live stream this morning we want to welcome you so glad that you are with us this morning well over the last few weeks we have uh, been in a series of messages from 1 Peter, and this morning we are going to continue in that message in 1 Peter. This morning we're going to move into chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Just two verses this morning are going to be our core verses. So if you have your scriptures with you this morning, I would encourage you to turn there with me, or if you'd like to turn on your electronic device or just watch the screen above me, however you'd like to do that, but that's where we're going to be this morning. We need to remember that Peter wrote this letter during an intense time of persecution for all the Christians. And Peter was trying to encourage them, despite all the wrong that was going on in the world, that they needed to be filled with hope. And once again, the things that we see in Scripture that happened many, many years ago come into play in our world today. Because while the persecution may not be on the same level as it was in Peter's day, there is still a definite desire among people for hope. There are a lot of people that are looking for something to hope in, something to grab onto, something that they can hang on to day after day. So today we're going to look at the verses and see how Peter spoke of a sense of hope that transcends into our time as well. So if we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 15, this is what we see. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Now, normally in the church, we talk about sharing our faith. We, we ask each other from time to time, have you had a chance to share your faith this week? Well, today we're going to be looking at sharing our hope. And there is a difference. The difference is this. When you share your faith, you tend to look back. 
You're looking back at the cross of Jesus where he died for our sins. We look back to Christ's resurrection where he emphatically proved that there's life after this life and we can have eternal life with him if we make a commitment to him. Sometimes we look back all the way into the New Testament, the prophecies that Christ fulfilled. And at other times when we're sharing our faith, we look back to what we used to be. And we sincerely, before we begin, sincerely living for Christ. We look back at, at what he's done for us, and we share those things with other people who don't yet have faith in Christ. And understand me, those things are important. We need to continue to do that. We need to tell people about what Christ has done for us. But then, when we share hope, we tend to look ahead. We're saying to our friends and family and others who don't know Christ yet, here's why I'm confident in the future. Here's why I'm optimistic when the rest of the world is pessimistic. When we share our hope, we're looking ahead at what God is going to do. And the Bible says, always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason of the hope that you have. I mean, maybe you've had someone come up to you. Maybe if you're one of those particularly joyful person, people, you have a lot of people come up to you, that you, but they say, why are you so optimistic? Why are you so joyful? Why do you have so much hope in a world like we live in? Why do you have joy when bad things are happening all around you? Where does your hope come from? And the Bible says we're always to be prepared to have a ready answer when those questions come. Tony Dungy, the football coach, says in the introduction of his book, Quiet Strength, that he was hesitant to write a book about his life. But people kept asking him why he had such hope in the midst of life's adversities. And he said, I, I like the saying, life is hard, but God is good. It's because of God's goodness that, that we can have hope, both for here and the hereafter. And it's the desire to share that hope that finally changed my no to a yes. He said, people kept asking, people kept after me about revealing the source of this hope. So he shares his hope, just like the Bible tells us. How are we doing that? How do we share the hope that we have? Or maybe a better question is, do you have hope? Is that something that is a part of you? What steps can we take to make sure that others will not only see our life and our hope and take heart? That's just the first part of the equation. But also, how do I specifically help them to take the same steps that have brought me that hope? Well, the first thing that we must do is this. We must set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. You have to set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. The first part of verse 15 says this, but in your hearts revere, or in italics is my word, set apart Christ as Lord. The word Lord means master, the person in charge, the one who calls the shots. And we have to go from a place where we decide what's best for our lives to the place where we trust Christ and follow his leadership about our lives. And that's the first thing that it takes for us to effectively share our hope with others. When we, when we set Christ apart and we put him in charge, Bill Hybels tells the story of a letter that he was given to read from a new convert to the person who greatly influenced her to make the decision for Christ. And in that letter, the new convert listed a number of qualities that she found genuine and contagious in the, older, in the life of the older Christian woman. I want you to listen to what, some of what she wrote. She said, you know, when we met, I began to discover a new vulnerability, a warmth, and a lack of pretense that impressed me. I saw in you a thriving spirit, no signs of internal stagnation anywhere. I could tell you were a growing person, and I liked that. I saw you had strong self-esteem, not based on the fluff of self-help books, but on something a whole lot deeper. I saw that you lived by convictions and priorities, and not just by convenience, selfish pleasure, or financial gain. And I had never met anyone like that before. I felt a depth of love and concern as you listened to me and did not judge me. 
You tried to understand me. You sympathized with me. You celebrated with me. You demonstrated kindness and generosity, and not just to me, but to other people as well. And you stood for something. You were willing to go against the grain of society and follow what you believed to be true, no matter what people said and no matter how much it cost you. And for those reasons and a whole host of others, I found myself really wanting what you had. Now that I've become a Christian, I wanted to write you and tell you how grateful I am, grateful beyond words for how you lived out your Christian life in front of me. What gives a person that kind of love and passion? That simply by living their life, it exudes Christ, that others around them see that. What makes a person glow to the point that others see that glow and want it for themselves? I believe it has to start by setting Christ apart as Lord in your heart. That's where it begins. This is, this is pivotal. You've got to do this. In your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Well, why does Peter use this framework? Why does he say we have to do this for sharing our hope? Well, in the Old Testament, there were certain utensils that were used by them for God's work, certain pieces of furniture, certain specific days, certain times, and that was the only time those things were used. Just like the Sabbath, for instance. Now it's the Lord's Day, and God commands us to set apart one day a week for worship and rest. Some of you ladies have fine china that is set apart, and you use it only on special days. It's never used any other time. It's just used on those special days. Maybe it's Christmas, maybe it's anniversary, whatever it is. But that is, that is something that's set aside. It's not used any other time. We all have clothes that we wear on certain occasions. And here in this passage, Peter reminds us that the thing that must be set apart for God is our heart. Christ must reign as Lord in our hearts. And not only has Christ commanded us to tell people about him when he says, go into the world and tell the good news about me, but we naturally want others to have the hope that we found in Christ. And in, and in order for this to happen, in order for others to want what we have, they must see and sense that God is king in all situations. That Christ is alive and reigns in our heart. Why our heart? Well, when the scripture talks about your heart, it's not that organ within us that pumps blood. It's talking about the seat of our emotions. It's talking about the center of our being. When you're really committed about something, you say, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Or I love you with all of my heart. And that's what it's talking about within Scripture. When you're saying that you've given your heart, given your life to Christ, that you've given him in your everything. Not just one organ, but everything. And that's the first step in sharing our hope. Christ must rule our hearts. Christ must rule our lives. We cannot rule. Pleasure cannot rule. Others cannot rule. Jesus must be king. And this doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect, but it means we'll recognize his ultimate authority in our lives. We will realize we're much better off when Christ is in charge than when we are in charge. And that's what attracts others to hope. They see Jesus in us because Jesus is attractive to people looking for hope. That's why they flocked to him while he was here on earth. They were looking for some sort of hope. So in order for them to want what they have seen in us, Jesus must be king in our lives. If there is a contradiction between what I want to do and what he wants me to do, I must yield to him because that's what he wants. If I want to sleep in on Sunday morning and he wants me to get up and come and preach, I have to yield to what he says and I have to be here. It turns out what's best for me is what he wants, not what I want. If I want to retaliate against someone for something that they've said or done to me, but God tells me to keep quiet and allow him to handle the situation, then I need to forget about it and let him handle it. He's Lord, not me, thankfully. The benefit is people cannot help but see Jesus in us when we practice this kind of lifestyle. 
I mentioned Tony Dungy's book, Quiet Strength. It also talks about the year he entered the NFL. He played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Steelers were ch Super Bowl champions. They had the famous steel curtain defense. They had this image of being a tough bunch of athletes. But the first week of camp, Dungy said he met a bunch of the members of the team who were Christians and they had a daily intense Bible study to which he was invited. He said, I had known from a young age that I was going to heaven, but I had never fully engaged God and let him direct my life moment by moment until I saw these guys do it. I had been a good kid by and large. I stayed out of trouble, was usually polite, stood up for my values. Yet the concept of putting God first in everything I did well, hadn't been my primary focus. He said, finally, I understood. I started to move from being a casual Christian to a fully committed believer and follower of Jesus. And this is where sharing your hope begins. Moving from that casual Christian to that being a fully committed follower of Christ. And others will be able to realize that Jesus is your Lord. So the very first thing that we must do is set apart Christ as Lord in our heart. The second thing that we must do is be prepared to explain why I have hope. In the second half of verse 15, it says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason of the hope that you have. We have to be prepared. For a lot of Christ followers, this is, this is precisely the problem. Some have Jesus as Lord of their hearts and lives, and, and that causes people to seek what they have. But when they were asked about it, they don't know how to answer. Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, why are you so positive when everything and everyone around you is so negative? And your response was, well, I just am. That person walked away going, well, that's great, but that didn't give me any help. Various excuses are sometimes given. I don't know the Bible all that well. I'm not real quick on my feet. I'm afraid they'll ask me something that I don't know. Well, in the early days of the church, Peter and John healed a crippled man, and for their efforts, they were persecuted. They were taken before the religious leaders of the day and grilled, and the religious authorities tried to intimidate them from continuing to proclaim Christ as their resurrected Lord, but they couldn't scare them. The leaders saw that Peter and John were not afraid to speak, and they understood that these men had no special training or no education, and they were amazed. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, we find these words. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I want you to remember a key phrase from that. These men had no special training or education. They, they didn't go to school. I mean, Peter and John were trained at seminary or even in the Jewish schools for scribes or scholars, yet they shared their hope. In fact, they went on sharing their hope even after being confronted the first time by those religious leaders. So the religious leaders called them back in again. And in verses 18 through 20 in chapter 4, we find these words. It says, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? And I just love this. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now I want you to remember the phrase from this. We can't keep quiet about what we've seen or heard. See, the beauty of sharing our hope is that it's your hope. It's what you have experienced. It's what you've seen. It's what you've heard. You don't need any fancy theological or, or philosophical type of answers. You don't need to be Billy Graham. You don't need to be the president of a Bible Institute. Scripture says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the answer to the hope that you have. They're not asking you to recite things. They're just saying, why do you have hope? Why do you have hope in Christ? 
If, if that's something, if that's a question this morning that has caused you to say, I don't know, then my suggestion would be that you go home this afternoon, tomorrow, sometime, and I'd ask you to write down why you have hope. And ask you to take a look at it, rewrite it, do whatever you want. Call a friend, have them come over and, and say, this is my hope. What? And, and I wouldn't even say, what do you think? Because that may not be their hope. It's what you have as hope. The scripture tells us that when somebody asks us the question, why are you full of hope? We have to give them an answer. We have to tell them why we are filled with hope. And it has to be something that you've seen, you've heard, Jesus has done for you. So in order to share my hope, the first thing is that I have to set Christ as part of his Lord in my life. And the second thing is I have to be prepared to explain why I have hope. And thirdly, be respectful of others. In the first part of verse 16, it says, but do this with gentleness and respect. When I set apart Christ as Lord in my heart and, and prepare myself to share my hope, I need to remind myself that how I share my hope is just as important as sharing it itself. You have to balance your enthusiasm with gentleness because we can't run over other people's opinions with a bulldozer of hope and think that they'll want what I have. We can't intimidate or coerce people into accepting our hope. Being pushy is not the right way to share our hope because when we do that, we end up pushing people away from Christ. They don't need to be judged or preached to or scolded or looked down upon. They need our source of hope. That's what they're looking for. But unfortunately in our world today, as it was when this letter was written, Christians are not thought of very highly. Not very often or rarely do you hear the nightly news start off with a perspective of what Christians think about the events going on in the world. In fact, most decisions that happen are not usually viewed through the lens of Christ at all. And when this happens, we may feel very angry and upset and bitter, but I believe that in all of this, Christ wants us to continue to share our hope. Because we have something that the world desperately needs. They may not know it, but they desperately need it. You remember the story of Jesus entering Jericho and he came upon a tax collector named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had heard about this Jesus guy. He had heard what Jesus was doing and he heard of all the miracles that Jesus had been performing. And he wanted to see him for himself. So he climbed up into a sycamore tree because he was a wee little man. Jesus comes down the road, stops, looks up in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house today. I'm going to have lunch with you. Now, how many of you were singing the song as I was telling that story? You might be saying, okay, okay, I, I understand it. Sure, we're supposed to be like Jesus. I mean, here is this guy, Zacchaeus, who was walk, working with the Romans, taxing people many times unfairly. Zacchaeus was skimming money off the top so he could have some himself. But Jesus didn't judge him. He lets him know that he's willing to sit down and have a meal with him. And that's how we're supposed to act towards people. And we may say, well, yeah, that's good. But I, I want you to see that not only are we to be like Jesus, but we're to be like the sycamore tree that Zacchaeus sat in. We can't forgive people like Jesus can. But what we can do is we can hold them up so that they can see Jesus. Our job is to show people how valuable they are to God, how much God loves them. Our job is to share our hope. And the bottom line of the message today is this. How are you doing on sharing your hope? Have you set apart Christ as Lord in your heart? That's the first thing that has to take place. Have you set him apart? Is he Lord in your heart? Is he Lord in your life? Is he first and foremost? That's the first thing you have to do. Before you can share hope with anybody, that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing you need to do is you have to be prepared to explain your hope. And the third thing 
is we need to be gentle and respectful of others when we share our hope. This is how I would suggest that we go about applying today's message to our own lives. I wanted to start right now, before you even step foot out of the church this morning, I wanted to begin right now. I want you to ask God to give you one person this week to share your hope with. I'm not asking you to look for two, three, four, five, a dozen. I'm just asking you to ask God, give me one person, one person this week, Lord, to share my hope with. And then I'm asking you to take it one step further. I'm asking you to ask God, God, I want you to have that person come to me and ask me why I have hope. I'm not asking you to go out and seek that person out. I'm asking you to ask God to bring that person to you. I'm asking God to, to help us set the table. You know, if, if you want to use a, a softball analogy, we're standing at the plate, and God is just lobbing an underhand ball to us and saying, go ahead and hit it. It's right there. I'm not asking you to go to great lengths. All I'm asking you is to say, God, give me one person to share my hope with this week. And Lord, by the way, have them come to me and ask me why I have hope. I believe God will do that. If you take that opportunity and you ask him to do that for you. Because in that, you want to share your hope with somebody. And I believe God wants people of this world at this time to have hope. And it's up to us as Christians to share our hope. And it's not somebody else's hope. It's your hope. What you've experienced, what you've heard, what you've seen, what God has done for you, and what you believe God is going to do for you. That's what you need to share with them. That's how we put this message today into play in our lives. We need to be proactive. We can't just leave here today and say, you know, that was a good message. No, that was really nice. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that. And, and we'll just go on and everything will be fine. Now, we need to act on the message today that God has given us, that Peter has given to the people then and given to us now. We have to share that hope because that's one thing this world needs more than anything else right now. They need hope. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come to you this morning. And we want to thank you for this message of hope. There, there are probably people in the sanctuary this morning, Lord, who, who need that hope just as much as anyone else does. They've had one of those weeks where everything has gone wrong. Anything that could happen did happen. And right now, they're in the sanctuary this morning, and they're saying, I... I I need some hope. And Lord, each one of us could look at our lives and we could look back at what you have done for us to bring us to this point. But Lord, we also need to look ahead at what you have promised us and the joy and the happiness that you bring to us. And Lord, you give us that to be able to share hope with those around us. And so, Lord, I pray that right now that everyone in the sanctuary would, would be asking you, Lord, give me one person. Give me one person to be able to share hope with this week. Now, maybe that means we're going to have to run home and we're going to have to write down that answer to that question. But, Lord, I believe that when we ask you this, that you will be faithful. And Lord, I also believe the second part of that is asking you to bring that person to us. And, and they'll ask the question, why, why do you have so much hope? Why are you always happy? Why do you have joy when everything else in the world is just falling apart? How can you do that? Lord, and you will give us the answer. You will help us to be able to give an answer to that question. So, Lord, I pray for each and every person in the sanctuary this morning, those who may be listening to us on live stream this morning who are hearing the message, and it's spoken to them. Lord, I ask that you would help us this morning to have hope. And not just have it and keep it inside of us, but have it to go forward. Have it to come out. 
And so, Lord, we just ask this week that every one of us would have an opportunity to share hope. And then, Lord, I'm asking that you bring us all back and that we would share those stories, whether individually or, or as a church. And, Lord, we will see that you truly are faithful in what you ask us to do. So, Lord, as we are dismissed this morning, we ask that you would just go with us throughout our week, Lord, that you would guide and direct us, that you would speak to us, Lord, that we would set you aside in our hearts as Lord and Savior. Lord, we just ask that you would just travel with us this week, that you would keep us safe, that, Lord, that you would bring us back into your house again next week, that we could worship you once again. And we just ask all of these things in your name and all of God's children said, Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Have a great week. God bless.